practice. So I want to start first with talking about medical management. It's something that's so important. We oftentimes jump the gun and start saying, let's go ahead and operate on someone. But we forget a fundamental element, which is the fact that hair loss is progressive in nature and that medical management can be a very, very important tool. Sean, can you roll the 10 minute time on this? So here's the key. There's two FDA cleared medicines, finasteride, also known as Propecia, and minoxidil, which is Rogaine. The non-FDA cleared one for specifically for, for alopecia is dutasteride, which is for um, benign prostatic hypertrophy. We're going to talk a little bit about that in case your patients ask or you want to incorporate that. We're also going to investigate in the female patient the idea it's not just throwing, not just giving them Rogaine, but also understanding there's other components that, that contribute to female hair loss. And it's very important that as a hair transplant surgeon, you understand those elements. We'll talk about that in a moment. The real key with this is that hair loss is progressive. And so even if you transplant the patient, they're going to continue to lose hair. And not everyone's a candidate for hair restoration. You have someone at 20 years of age starting to lose hair, rapidly progressing. You're going to have a situation where you can have an unnatural result appear over time. And they're actually a very very good candidate for, for medical management. So remember one thing is that if the patient is losing hair, don't just think about putting hair back in, but consider slowing down that speeding train of hair loss, even if you're going to do a hair transplant. Because if you do a great hair transplant, I like to say of Vidal Sassoon, if you're old enough, is that if you don't look good, we don't look good. And the concept behind that is that whatever we give you in transplant, if the other medical management is slowing down the loss, increasing some of the thickness, your result actually looks better. And that's really, really important to combine it even with surg surgical transplant. Let's first talk about finasteride. This is the workhorse here. And finasteride at the five milligram dose is known as Proscar, and at the one milligram dose for hair loss is known as Propecia. It is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor type 2. It, it blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. And the idea here is that DHT is what creates problems with male uh, hair loss. And let's take a step back and understand this, because it's not like one day you have hair, then you don't have hair. Male pattern baldness is about a transition from full, thick terminal hairs to baby, wispy, vellus hairs to zero hairs. And the real key, uh, key with finasteride and Rogaine is taking, Danny, I'm going to start and then I'll let you uh, do the next one. It, we're, you're going to take those baby vellus hairs and move them back into full head of hair, or full, to the fuller, thicker hairs. But once those hairs are just gone, the finasteride is doing very little to, to work, work on that. And just to make that clarification, finasteride is an oral pill once a day at one milligram versus Rogaine, which is a topical application which we'll talk about further. Let's compare the five milligram Proscar dose versus the one milligram Propecia dose or finasteride dose for hair loss. They're, they actually both reduce DHT pretty similarly and there, there's been studies that show that. The PSA has actually halved and so especially in someone older you make sure that the doctor knows that they need to double the PSA score so that they get a, a good accurate understanding of what their PSA situation is. Prostate volume actually is very similarly reduced but the voiding symptoms are significantly improved with the five milligram dose, dose. Hence, that is why the five milligram dose is indicated for the uh, gentleman with prostate issues, and the one milligram dose is sufficient for hair loss. Um, the, the side effects we'll talk about further in a moment are very similar in profile between the five and one milligram dosing. The Finasteride, as I said, works on miniaturized hairs, those baby vellus hairs, and getting them to thick terminal hairs once again. It does not work on slick baldness. When someone comes in with a Norwood 6-7 and they've got nothing on top, it may slow down the further progression of existing hairs, but you're not going to really thicken any hairs that don't exist. So that's something very, very important. So it slows down that speeding train. Really, really, if you're, if you're going to consider hair restoration, you must understand how, how to, to use these medications for your patients. The other thing that's a, a big mis, uh, misunderstanding is some of the early FDA trials showed the benefits of finasteride and Rogaine in the crown but it works globally. And that's something that patients will be confused about. Some of the outdated package inserts talk more about the crown, but it really works in a global fashion across all areas of the head. And finasteride takes about six to 12 months to work. The other thing that I think is really important, if you're gonna consider a hair transplant and you look in there and you see, 
let's say, 70% miniaturized or these vellus hairs all over the place. If you go in there and you start transplanting into that, that thing is going to shed all over the place. And you're going to have a semi-bald patient for about four to six months, and they're not going to be very pleased with you. So if you see a lot of these baby hairs or vellus hairs, truly consider perioperatively, maybe a few months before, to stabilize those hairs. And what that means is that it may not grow completely back into a terminal situation, but there's a less chance of shedding in that sensitive three to four month window following a hair transplant. The other concept behind this is it doesn't just work in that first year. They've shown studies out to five years that if you look at the bottom chart, if you look at the bottom uh, line here, this is just natural progressive hair loss without uh, intervention. And this is ongoing sta stability of finasteride over many, many years. So something to consider. But the other thing we're going to talk about is if you do stop it, you actually lose everything you gained over the period of time you're on it, which is discouraging. But it's something that's important you describe that to your patients. The side effects. There's erectile dysfunction, loss of libido. We he heard about this, breast tenderness. And 58% of these resolve. Um, with ongoing therapy. And if you look at the, the it's about 3.8% versus 2.1% placebo. The side effects um, us usually should stop when, when, when you stop it. There are some uh, rare case studies of persistence of side effects, and something that I think is important to know, but it's pretty, pretty unlikely that that should be the case. Finasteride and, um, and the prostate. I just want to walk you through the last few years of understanding how we've come to think about finasteride um, and the relationship to the prostate because, it, it's, because you're taking a medication that is systemic in nature. And the idea besides just having the PSA value, it also is important to understand that some of the early uh, studies, 2005 or so, 2006, were looking at the fact that there is possibly a higher chance of prostate cancer with taking finasteride. And then they found that to be a truly a pathologic artery artifact, that there was a shrinking of the prostate and there was a, that they found these higher grade tumors only because of the artifact of, of, of biopsying a higher likelihood of finding the cancer. If anything, they've actually shown in the 2008 studies, there's been about a 25 or 30 percent reduction in long-term prostate cancer risk with ongoing finasteride at the five milligram dose. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. But the concept behind this is that we don't know what it really does at a one milligram dose, but at a five milligram dose, there can be possibly long-term protective value against prostate cancer at a rate of about 25 to 30 percent reduction. The other just an important idea is that finasteride can also um, be something that could be, uh, you shouldn't give it to, pro to professional athletes or at least counsel them that this could be something that's banned. It's important. For finasteride in women, it's very unclear exactly um, if it's beneficial. Obviously, in the premenopausal setting, you're very worried about a teratogenic effect on the male fetus. But in postmenopausal women, some of the early studies with Price and Whiting showed that there was no benefit in a controlled setting. Iorezzo in 2006 showed that there was possibly a benefit. It was a very uncontrolled setting. Um, but there is some consensus that in postmenopausal women that are experiencing hyperandrogenism, a unique uh, subset could actually benefit from finasteride. How do I use it? Generally speaking, I don't use it in postmenopausal women, but I, I have, in an anecdotal fashion, uh, done it in, in select patients and shown that there, there has been, uh, again, uncontrolled improvement, always combined with uh, Rogaine or Minoxidil. Cost is about $60 to $80. Uh, just stay on time. I'm going to move forward with this. And the patent continues to, to 2013.